and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, today we are covering Kevlar. What is Kevlar? Kevlar 101. I don't know. Something about Kevlar. Something about Kevlar. So James, before we get started, mm, mm. this is now our second episode today because James and I, we, we batch our recordings because we we're do. so efficient. Mm. Uh, our previous recording, make sure you check out Exxon Mobil at some point when it's out there, um, had a Pittsburgh connection. Drake's well, well Titus PA. Um, this one is even closer. The person that invented Kevlar was a lady by the name of Stephanie Qualick. She was born in 1923 and unfortunately passed away in 2014. She was born in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. No. Go New Ken. New Ken's pretty close to me. It used to be it's, real close to really one of my close old houses. To where you used to live. Yeah. Um, her father died when she was young and he was kind of like a naturalist. So she was really into like the outdoors and, you know, planting things and like all the outdoorsy things that you do back then. Her mother was a stay at home mother and she was uh, she kind of showed her how to like sew and she really got into fabrics completely unrelated to working for DuPont, which we'll get to in a little <laughs> bit. But like she was really into sewing and fabrics. And uh, so she went to Margaret Morrison Carnegie College, which then became uh, Carnegie Mellon University before it was Carnegie Mellon University. I did not um, know that. That's interesting. Yeah. And she applied to Exxon no, Gulf. It was Gulf. That's right. She applied to Gulf Chemicals, who was a, 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 a petroleum manufacturer, gasoline manufacturer, and she applied to DuPont like simultaneously. Okay. And I watched this video and supposedly the story was she's at DuPont interviewing with the cat at DuPont and he's like, oh, we'll get back to you. And before she left the interview, she's like, I'd really like to know as soon as possible because I have other offers on the table and I really need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And the story goes, he calls up his receptionist and dictates the offer letter to the receptionist. And she actually <laughs> got the offer on the spot. Like as she's um, walking out the door. As she's walking out the door, they handed it to her. Oh so, my goodness. Uh, so she goes to DuPont. She has plans of going back to school to go into the medical field, but she gets so interested in, so this is right after uh, polyester was invented. Uh, which DuPont invented. Um, huh. And she was You're really- You're full in, of information oh, today, she, Luke. She this was she, amazing. As soon as I saw the new Ken connection, I was like, I got to dig into this <laughs> lady. Uh, so she got really into like working with all these different fibers and synthesizing, you know, different chemicals to do different things. And what happened was uh, when she was about 40 years old, um, she got on this special team at DuPont that was uh, called upon to create a super lightweight material that was super strong that would replace steel inside of tires, like the, the steel belting inside of tires. Were the tires you saw spelled with a Y? Sometimes they are. It's, it's how, that's how the Brits spell it. Yeah. They uh, need to I learn believe. English. They do need to learn the English. <laughs> I totally agree with you. So the idea was they needed to reduce the dependency on steel and they wanted to do this fabric. And you're going to talk about the actual process, so I won't I steal your thunder there. Thanks. But she basically single-handedly, she was on a team, but she was the one supposedly that was doing the eyedroppers and the Bunsen burners. Uh, she actually created the chemical formula that then became Kevlar. And... Uh, and there was all kinds of stuff where like she was trying to get the spinner to mm -hmm. spin the chemical because it's a liquid, right? Whenever she made the chemical and the spinner was like, oh, no, there's all kinds of debris in it because it's like a milky looking texture. And she filtered it. And it was like it wasn't milky. It was that's just what the texture looked like. It was kind of unlike other polymers. Most other polymers are like honey. Huh. Hers was like a milky water substance. Uh, and the guy assumed the spinner that would make the actual threads assumed it was particles that was going to mess up his machine. Oh, yeah. And she tells the story. That. He felt guilty and did it anyways and made this incredible material called Kevlar. Charles Smolin. 
Was that his name? A, uh, yeah. Oh, that I, his I, name. I didn't know that was his name. There you go. You got like all of the information. That was all I had to contribute there. Sorry. <laughs> so one more time, what was the name of CMU before it was CMU? Uh, well, it was it was like a division. This this oh. was the women's college. It was oh. uh, Margaret Morrison Carnegie College. Interesting. So before we move on to anything else, I'm going to throw this out there because I Shoot. think it might be interesting. A series on the history of great universities. Carnegie Mellon, Harvard, Oxford, MIT, MIT, all of those. Penn like, how did State. they get started? Mostly just Penn State. Like, how did they get started? Penn State has a really fascinating history, how they got their reactor, all of this different stuff. There's a reactor at Penn State. Yeah. Yeah. One of the few colleges. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Uh, if any of our listeners think that's a good idea, email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com and say, James, you were so smart. Yes, make that series. Um, okay, so any more on that quick history about our friend Stephanie? Uh, no, she was just a huge pioneer, obviously. She was, you know, uh, a, a, a female in a mostly male-dominated, oh, yeah. you know, scientific field. And I'm sure it's still mostly male-dominated. It is. So and, that's and fascinating. She, and she's super personable. Like, I saw a bunch of videos she, she did where she was actually talking with students and getting, like, kids into STEM. And wow. uh, super nice lady. And Pittsburgh native. I love it. I love that too. So before we get into how it's made, can I talk a little bit about what it is? Yes. Kevlar is a poly para, oh goodness, <laughs> phenyl enaterafithylamide, PPDT for those of you who can't pronounce that. Mm -hmm. um, the structure is composed of benzene rings. Gosh, I hate chemistry so much. It's <laughs> composed of benzene rings responsible for high thermal stability, which is a big part of why Kevlar is so great, um, along with para substitutions, which result in high modulus of strength. Fun fact for you, Luke, Shoot. you know, come on, you know, high para modulus. Para substitutions right? are my thing. Yeah, of course they are. Kevlar is a uh, type of plastic, like you said, with very high tensile strength, with five to eight times the tensile strength of steel wire. That's remarkable. Fun fact. I, I trump your fun fact, Jim, oh, with another my one. Goodness. It has terrible compressive strength. That's wow. why you don't see, that's why you don't see like auto body panels being made with Kevlar because it's great pulling. It's super strong pulling, but pushing, it doesn't do sense. great. So, huh. Very cool. Um, in the case of Kevlar, the repeating units form chains. These chains line up parallel to each other on their own, just like liquid crystals used for making LCD TVs. So check out our episodes on the history of TV and the best TV technology for your upcoming television purchase, if you haven't already. But that's really interesting that they are kind of like self-aligning. And this is showing a behavior known as nomadic behavior. Uh, the chains are cross-linked with hydrogen bonds, which is what gives the material that super high tensile strength. Do you have anything else you wanted to add into uh, the, so the sciences? I, I, so I don't know if you said this or not, or maybe Probably I found a different not. one. So, so like it, it's the two things that make it up. So Kevlar is made by a condensing reaction of anamine, A-N-I-N-E, which is a phenyl... 1,4-phenyldimyanine. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, I'm terrible. Uh, and acid chloride, tera pentothal chloride. There you go. So I'm apparently they me. like, they, they condense them. So you heat them up, the condensation occurs, they mix in the condensation field. Mm -hmm. And then whenever they precipitate out of the wow. condensation field, they are now combined. Very good. I love it. Um, I was going to move on to the manufacturing process next. Is there anything else you had that you wanted to cover quickly? Mm, no. All right. So before we move on to manufacturing, let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. DuPont. Not DuPont, Luke. It's got to be better DuPont. than DuPont. It is way better than DuPont. It is the Big Compute Podcast. Here you go. Have a listen. What can computational science tell us about the tsunami generated by the biggest earthquake to ever hit Europe? Before you know it, everything is shaking, and shaking loudly. What makes the coronavirus so contagious? It's the machine that literally will latch on to your human cell and 
ultimately like infect you. And what was it like when a massive act of cyber warfare stopped an entire country in its tracks? Their ATM greets you with red text over a black screen. This is really starting to creep you out. These are just some of the questions being answered every day through the power of computing. And on season two of the Big Compute podcast, we transport you to the heart of these stories, giving you a firsthand look at how computational science is changing our world. Find the Big Compute podcast wherever you get your audio or visit bigcompute.org. All right. So in addition to that, we do have one shout out that I want to get to. So this is Alex M. Good old A-Dog. A-Dog wrote a huge email. Very thoughtful. <laughs> very long. long I love email. I never see these because oh you, you've never given me access to the email. No, that's for good reason. Um, I mean, so well thought out. And sometimes I'm just looking for a quick shout out. And then I see this and I was like, oh my goodness, that was such a big email. Anyways, I really can't read it all here. But he suggested, he had a lot of good ideas. He suggested a new unit of measure based off of our units of measure episodes. The UPE pronounced UP, which is basically a measurement of awesomeness based on how great our podcast is. So I love this. Oh. Things It's on a scale of zero to one UPs. Things that would be a one would be Troy Polamalu, Elon Musk, and of yeah. course us. Things that would be zeros would be such things. And these are examples he gave. Things such as the Kardashians, Kanye West, and Windows 10. <laughs> and civil engineers. <laughs> and civil engineers. Aw, zero UPs for well, them. How do we say UPs? Yuppies. Yuppies. Like e W W. I am totally. E -E. We are we are coining this, James. Yuppies. I know. I think it's great. But he did want us to to say something on on live podcast here. Oh no! Because we're Pittsburghers. His family has Pittsburgh connections. They okay. like lived here. Um, I need you to say, and I'm gonna. I'm embarrassed even saying it. The words towel and tile. Tau and tau. Are you doing that intentionally? No, it's, 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 a, it's a tau and a tau. <laughs> no. Is that really how you say it? That's how I say it. You don't say towel? Where's the tau? W? Towel? What, what are you all prim and proper and fancy? It's tau and tau. <laughs> I can't tell if you're joking or not. I, I, I have a stack of towels right over there. Is that towels or tiles? Well, no, I dry my body off with a towel. Okay, okay. That's, and I'm going to do know. some towel work this weekend in my bathroom. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I love everything about that. So he sent this, and I had no idea what he was asking. Like, why would we have any problem saying these words? But I was really embarrassed. But now that I heard you say them, yeah. it's up there with the Ferris wheel yeah, and the fair, it's the wind meals. <laughs> wind meals and star trek so i love it awesome if any of you have any words that you would like us to say on our podcast if you want to get some stickers if you <laughs> oh goodness if you want some shout outs if you want to suggest any things that might rate highly on the up scale uh go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com and don't forget to subscribe, like, share. And as always, we love the reviews. And you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast. Luke, do you really say those words that way? I do. I, I do. Uh, well, I, like in mixed company, I don't. But like when I'm just like around my house, when I'm around my house, you know, house. that's what I do. When you're going downtown. Yeah. Okay. So manufacturing process of Kevlar. What do you got? So it's made from, like you were saying, condensation reaction of para- whatever yep and tell of phallic acid ppdt the presence of the amine amine groups of mm -hmm. aromatic aromatic like the smell ring results uh in a rod like structure which has high glass transition temperature and low solubility so this is all just kind of fancy talk for what you were talking about cloudy concoction don't break my machine Yep. The chains of polymer connected to each other via hydrogen bonds, like I had mentioned, between adjacent polar groups uh, explaining what is, or making what is Kevlar. Um, due to the high glass transition temperature and the poor solubility, these fibers are difficult to process via conventional drying techniques that you would typically use. Hence, the melt spinning is used for their fabrication. So during melt spinning, the PPDT solution is extruded in a spinneret 
and drawn through an air gap resulting in orientation of the liquid crystalline domains in the flow direction. So as it flows. So and essentially imagine taking a spaghetti strainer and pouring like water into it and it comes out in strands. I saw a picture of what it looks like. That's essentially what you, it is. You kind of nailed it. So like you pour it into a big funnel, right? A big That's hopper. A, a, a hopper. A Gosh, hopper. You're a science guy. A hopper, for those of you in the know, and that's the polymer melt. There's then a pump that pushes it through and it pushes it through a filter, which has like a filter. So it comes out real thin and that comes through the spinneret. Just like Luke was saying, it's kind of like pouring pasta into a strainer and the water coming out. But that water coming out is going to be the Kevlar concoction where they blast it with cold air. What's the noise that it would make, Luke? Okay, perfect down the spinning tower, and then they apply a fiber finish to it. It wraps around um, some like some pulleys, we'll say, not pulleys, but uh, things that it spins around. Spools would be the word I'm going for, thank you. Um, and it, that helps solidify the fibers, and then it wraps that up in a coil kind of around another spool as the finished product. But all of this process is what it has to take to make it since it's such a funky concoction, we're going to say. So instead of reading the paragraph that I had copy and pasted, I just described the picture that you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, so liquid crystal polymer at the top, all the lines are squiggly and going in crazy directions. That gets through that melting spin and that's what causes them to become parallel a with line. each other. Yep. A line, thank you. Um, very high orientation with no chain folding, Luke. And that's what gives it its crazy strength. And then we spool it up and we make sweet, sweet things out of it. So it's literally like, it, it's, it's, it's like the, as it comes out of the, the spool, it actually looks like, like hair. Like it's just uh -huh. really long, thin pieces of hair. It's a similar process to how they make Gorilla Glass. They basically have these really high extruders and it drops kind out. Kind of, so. sort of, but those but, are much but bigger, not, But it's not they? a sheet. Yeah. And it's not a sheet. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So. Cool. So the next thing I had to talk about were other uses for Kevlar other than what we all know it for, which would be the bulletproof. I wanted to talk Kevlar. about its properties, like, oh, like, like, like why it has superb properties. properties. Do tell me. Okay. So, uh, so first of all, you might not know this, but it, it's actually a plastic that doesn't melt. Uh, so it's reasonably good at withstanding temperatures all the way up to 450 degrees Celsius which is about 850 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it doesn't burn. So a lot of times oven gloves and like grill mitts and stuff like that might have Kevlar in them. Um, it also does really well with thermal changes. So it doesn't expand and contract a lot. So it, it, there's basically no difference uh, when it gets down to super low temperatures uh, as well. So like, uh, unlike other plastics, they tend to get, or polymers, sometimes they get brittle. Uh, it, it does, it does really well with ultraviolet sunlight. So the, the fibers, uh, do pretty well, uh, Kevlar, what it's mostly known for that we think of is like the, uh, the strength of it. And everybody thinks like it's a single sheet of Kevlar and the bullet doesn't go through it, or the knife doesn't go through it, or if it's in a helmet, but the reality is there are multiple woven sheets. So if you've ever seen like uh, basket weaving, that's essentially what they do with the day basket. I majored weave. in that. <laughs> you, you, you did Penn state, of course. That's right. Uh, so they basically basket weave the Kevlar. And what happens is because of the tensile strength, because you're, you're, you're pulling it whenever the bullet hits it, like the first couple sheets probably break, but what happens is the multiple layers reduce that energy and it gets pushed out into the rest of the fibers in that weave. And that's why it doesn't make its way through. You do get an incredible bruise. Apparently I watched this video about this guy. Oh, how could was, you not? Was shot and literally like he, he had this black and blue mark on his chest that was like the size of a plate. Uh, but he was still alive. Had a couple, I think he had a broken rib or something like that. Oh, uh, but still alive. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but still alive. So uh, some pretty crazy applications. Uh, they use it, they combine it a lot of times with uh, carbon fiber uh, for additional strength whenever they're making things like, you know, mountain bikes and different things like that. So, uh, so lots and lots of applications. Wow, very good. Yeah. Um, speaking of the applications, I wanted to talk about the different types of Kevlar and some of those applications. Is that okay? 
I think that's good. All right. So to start the different types, Kevlar K29. Um, it's a high toughness grade used in industrial applications like cables, um, body slash vehicle, uh, brake linings, things like that. Kevlar K49, high modulus used in rope and cable products. K100, which feels like it would be the best, but Should I guess be it best. isn't. Uh, it's the colored version of Kevlar. So I guess that's special. I don't know. I think it's Kevlar, yellow. Is it like that I nylon rope? Yeah, yeah, I think so. K119, it has higher elongation and more fatigue resistance. It's fascinating that they have all of these different flavors. K129, it's higher tenacity grade utilized in ballistics applications. And then Kevlar AP, which seems to not follow the normal naming trend. It has 15% higher tensile strength than K29. So I guess go with that if you want the most tensile strength. Um, oh, goodness. These are used in things like ballistics and defense, composites in aircraft structural parts, belts, hoses, and things like that for automation or automotive uh, heating and cooling systems, fiber optics, which is interesting, and electromechanical cables, uh, friction products and gaskets, adhesives and sealants to make them extra strong, and uh, protective apparel in automobile and aircrafts. I have a bunch of other things that would be more commonplace for maybe someone like you and I, Luke. You and I. But before we do that, let's take a break for this week's Luke's Rant. So this is not a rant, James. This oh. is a call to action for our listeners. So oh. you and I are both enormous dog lovers. Right? I love dogs. Like I, I mean, I don't necessarily love just enormous dogs. I am a large lover of dogs yes i love dogs like literally before you and i started doing this podcast like just this morning i was spooning my dog as she was sleeping <laughs> i miss uh, her but in okay. her in her sunspot but this is a call to action for our listeners so there is a website called project pause oh. uh, we can make sure we put a link to it uh, wherever you happen to be listening or watching and this is a uh, a nonprofit organization nationwide that purchases Kevlar vests for service dogs and police wow. animals because these are really expensive and you know depending on the size of the dog that the that the, your local police department has, um, it's really expensive. So this is uh, they're a five hundred one c three totally legit. I don't even um, so know what that means. It means they're a nonprofit organization oh. and you have to qualify for that. There's special things you have to do. So, uh, so what they do is they take your donations and then they purchase canine Kevlar vests that protect our uh, canine units oh, uh, in goodness. case of a stabbing or a shooting or something like that. So these dogs that are protecting your neighborhoods don't always have a Kevlar vest uh, because the local borough might not be able to afford it. So this organization provides those. So I encourage all of our listeners to, again, go to projectpausealive.org and make a donation. Wow. Luke, I think I make it pretty clear on this podcast that I do not think very highly of you, but that really just impressed me a lot. Well You're done. Welcome. Well done, you. Huh. Do you know how much it costs to make, get one of those vests? Uh, the, a couple sites I saw said for like your typical canine Kevlar vest is somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,300. Oh, goodness. And once they get used, you got to get a new one. Like if, if he gets stabbed or shot or something right. happens to it. Right. Um, yeah. And they're, 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 they're sized per dog. So they got to be form fitting. You know, it's not just like you pick off the rack kind of thing. If so. we took like all of our podcast earnings, we could probably donate it and get like a Yorkie sized one. <laughs> I don't know if Yorkies are police dogs. <laughs> They might be. They were they were critical to World War II for I'm, bomb sniffing and stuff. <sighs> oh, I'm wow. just envisioning a Yorkie police dog right now. I know it's a, great. It's a bad picture. Oh, that's wonderful. Wow, good, right. good job. Okay, Thank um, you. a few more things that uh, Kevlar can be used for in addition to dog vests um, in tennis strings. High durability. Uh, it's considered a primary factor for tennis strings. Kevlar grades 16, 17, and 18 are primary grades, which are used for making Kevlar strings. Polyester has slowly replaced these, but maybe you could still find some of those. For fast racing cars, which I like know Corvettes. you like to, Like Corvettes. Like the one you have. 
much like the one I have, and bikes, much like the one you have. You have, you no, have a bike, there's, right? there's no Kevlar in my bike. <laughs> Excessive friction on tires causes burning and overheating. Oh, maybe I do have Kevlar. Uh, the tire is composed of steel wires wrapped in rubber. These steel wires are insufficient to absorb all heat. That's why materials, material challenges came at high speeds. So Kevlar is a good heat resistant material and its ability to work with high tension situations coupled with that heat resistance means that nowadays racing car tires have Kevlar as their essential ingredient. Interesting. Kevla Kevlar gloves for when you're chopping up stuff or sharpening your knives. I have one of them that came with my knife sharpener. I should have wore it not so long ago when I chopped off my finger. So that would have been smart. Um, motorcycle enthusiasts are very thankful for Kevlar, Luke. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe my buddy Clark, if he ever listens still, you know, he might be thankful for it because I know he's laid down his bike before uh, because many of the jackets that they wear are made with Kevlar. So the elbows and shoulder padding found in a lot of these jackets is where you find Kevlar for protection. My, my nephew actually had like a jacket and a set of pants that had like Kevlar panels that almost like, almost like football pants. And I, yeah. I, I, put them, I put them on one time and it was the most uncomfortable, like it was the most uncomfortable thing. It's like, I, I literally felt like I was getting ready to play like rollerball or something like that. It was yeah. Yeah, crazy rollerball many people use smartphones on a daily basis luke whoever wrote that is just great um but they don't realize that the back plate use kevlar to help protect the inner mechanics mm. that's that's exactly it luke you just showed Interesting. it uh fun fact recently an outdoor apparel company called volback made a hoodie out of kevlar, kevlar fibers the hoodie can literally survive extreme temperatures such as those at the poles of mars or on the surface of Mercury. Kind of on a sad note, but similar on the apparel line. So there have been multiple companies that have made children's backpacks, unfortunately, because of how crazy this world is no. out of Kevlar. And uh, I've never thought of that. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 it, you know, all these different things happen, you know, uh, and, and yeah, so these, these companies have I'm going to say capitalized. Maybe it's a good thing. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like making a backpack out of Kevlar is maybe a good thing. Maybe you're, I don't know, selling something. Hopefully they'll never need. I, I, I don't know how I feel about it. it. It's weird to think that a kid has to wear a Kevlar backpack to school to feel safe sometimes. I, don't like I guess that. it depends. Yeah, it's a terrible thought. So yeah. um, what else do you have? I have one last fun fact that I'm sure is on the top of everybody's mind right now. Um, James? I don't know if it's on the top of my mind, but go ahead. Where did the name Kevlar come from? I, d I don't know. Fun fact. Nobody knows. Oh. Apparently, <laughs> uh, like I, I scoured. And when I say scour, it was it's a been good- at least two minutes. It was a good six, seven minutes, James. Wow. You know me. You did scour. And apparently- it was just like a marketing name, like like they. It's not related to the chemical properties. It's not related to the founder, uh, Stephanie. Uh, what was her name again? Uh, Stephanie Colwick, uh, good Colwick. old Polish girl. Not, not, um, not Kevlar. No, not Kevlar. But yeah, so apparently it, it was just like a, a name that the marketing company came up with, and it's it's a cool sounding name. So that's interesting. I looked huh. everywhere. Everywhere, Nothing. everywhere on the Googles. Six or seven um, minutes. The last thing that I had to talk about was bulletproof vests, but I feel Shoot. like you kind of, <laughs> see what you did there? Oh, I, I didn't even realize I did it. Okay. I feel like you kind of covered it. So I'll do it real quickly here. So bulletproof materials work by absorbing the kinetic energy of the fired shots and dissipating it so that the speed of the bullet reduces to zero, which is helpful, um, which decreases the penetrating power and the damage. So like you were saying with that weave, you know, some stuff might snap along the way, but the plan is to slow it down enough that it only bruises, breaks or ribs, whatever, doesn't kill you. Uh, when the bullet hits the Kevlar vest, it gets caught in that web of super, super strong fibers, which absorbs and dissipates the energy uh, drastically reducing the impact of the bullet. This happens because the fibers are lined up so tightly that it takes a great deal of energy to separate them. Sometimes the vests are strong enough to cause the bullets themselves to become distorted or bent. Like you yeah, can look like, at pictures like of them. Yeah, yeah. And they like are all smashed up, which is kind of neat. So obviously the more layers of Kevlar sheets that you have, the greater the protection power, depending on the grade of the Kevlar used and the number of layers, vests can be more or less made bulletproof. 
the vests are also used as armor against knives and daggers and other things. Do people use daggers still? I thought they <laughs> like stopped using that in like Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> another added advantage is their lightweight compared to their steel counterparts. So that's helpful, which were once worn by like knights and things like that. Do you think yeah. that it could, do you think Valyrian steel could go through it or no? Uh, Luke, that was so, so stupid. Obviously it can, come on. <laughs> what kind of stupid question is that? Ah, I love that. Um, if you haven't checked out our episode on blacksmithing of medieval knight's armor, do that. Or if you've checked out our uh, weapons of the medieval times, torture devices and things like that, check those out as well. They have nothing to do with Kevlar, but I love those no. episodes. Um, have you seen, real quick, um, the potential to use silkworm thread as a bulletproof material? Yeah, supposedly they cross, like they genetically engineer the silkworm with like some kind of spider too that has something in it and Ooh. it makes the it makes the the silkworm thread like super strong. That's like straight out of the movie Spider-Man. That makes me uncomfortable. It like if it would have just been silkworm spitting that stuff out and then weaving it together somehow real tight, that's one thing. But when you start crossbreeding these animals to like make this product that Oh, I don't know. It seems like they're just going to turn on us and take I, over the world. I saw this worm. It was like that. It was, it was gross. It was this green worm. It was on my shed the other day. Ugh. And I'm just, imagine that as a spider. I don't need that. Like, I don't, that's terrible. I don't, it's better than a snake. Anyways, yeah. uh, anything else you wanted to add? That's all I got. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hopefully you all learned lots of things about Kevlar. I am fascinated about the whole uh, Pittsburgh connection there, Luke. I really appreciate that. Again, if you think that the idea of Uncovering the history of great universities, especially great engineering universities, is of interest. Let us know by emailing us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see it.